I want to thank you all for coming um, to this rescheduled event, um, but we were not to be deterred uh, because the revolution in Syria continues and Stephen's book um, becomes uh, even more topical uh, day by day uh, as the situation in Syria becomes that much more unstable. Uh, so uh, my, our guest today uh, is Stephen Starr. Uh, Stephen uh, is a journalist. Uh, he moved to Damascus in Syria uh, in, in uh, January 2007. And uh, he began to work uh, first as an editor uh, for the Syria Times and then later as a freelance journalist. Uh, he is reported from Iraq and Lebanon. Uh, he covered the 2009 elections in Beirut. And until uh, February 2012, he reported Syria's popular uprising, uh, unrestricted from inside the country, and has written a book, which is on sale at the back of this room, so I urge you to buy a copy, um, called Revolt in Syria, Eyewitness to the Uprising. And I just want to um, just read a couple of reviews, or blurbs from reviews of the book, which have been very favorable. The Economist says his material is vivid, thought-provoking and sometimes shocking. Uh, given that the authorities knew who he was and where he lived, it is impressive that he spoke to such a wide variety of Syrians. Uh, the Guardian, the Times, the TLS, the Irish Times, the New Statesman, the Spectator, all have glowing reviews. Uh, Stephen um, is, uh, you know, is very important to us here at NYU because he's actually the editor of Const Dev, which is a Twitter feed that we run at the Center for Constitutional Transitions uh, that it retweets news stories from around the Middle East uh, and North Africa. And he is the editor of, of, of that feed, although he works for us remotely from Toronto. And he's currently in Toronto, a journalism fellow at the Monk School uh, for Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. And so we're very grateful that he came down today. So our format uh, for the event is that Stephen will speak for about half an hour or so. Thereabouts, yeah. Thereabouts, and then we'll open it up to discussion. Okay. Stephen, All right. thank you. All right, thanks very much, Sajid, for having me down here. Much appreciated. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Cathy Glynn as well. She's been fantastic in uh, organizing um, everything. Um, I guess I can start myself firstly. I graduated from um, a master's course in international security and conflict studies in Dublin in 2007. Um, and essentially, as any graduate or recent graduate, there were very little jobs in Ireland at the time, or even the UK related to that subject. So it was very kind of difficult, obviously, to get kind of, you know, real experience or experience that would be, that I was interested in, at least. And uh, obviously, I had an interest in traveling. Um, and so flew to Turkey and spent a couple of weeks in Turkey and traveled down by bus. I don't know if anyone's done this grueling bus trip or any anyone of you intend to do in the future from, uh, from Istanbul down to Damascus. And uh, got to Damascus. I didn't know anyone there. My plan, I guess, essentially was, was to stay there, and, um, and that was it, really. And maybe do some writing and uh, get to understand the country, because obviously at the, in 2007 it was a country that very little people in the English-speaking world, at least, um, knew much about, other than it was this police state. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I stayed there and started working for a state-run newspaper called Syria Times which shared offices actually with um, a state Arabic newspaper called Tishreen. And I worked there for about um, six months before it closed. But it was really um, enlightening in the sense that you get to understand how the regime's propaganda kind of works. Uh, I worked there as an editor, as a kind of a copy editor, and I wrote some kind of opinion pieces in, in that. Uh, and it was, I guess, um, perhaps useful in that the war in Iraq was still ongoing. So I could write, I mean, I was writing for this very controlled and very one-sided publication, but at the same time, you, you know, I had some of these pretty kind of um, legitimate uh, topics to discuss, kind of namely Iraq and that. Um, but it, it did, I mean, it, it gave me really good insight into how the Syrian state works, and it, it not just in the newspaper sector, but right across different ministries and different government sectors there. Um, you know, people, it was staffed by journalists per se, but they weren't journalists in the way we kind of know journalists. Um, people there who worked there, the Syrians who worked there, saw it as a, as a job, first and foremost. And they received a very small wage, I think something like $250 a month. Um, and the, in terms of kind of ethics and, and you know, journalistic standards, they were, they were non-existent. For them it was a job and, uh, and that was it, essentially. Um, that closed in June 2008 and I started freelancing for a number of kind of local 
magazines and newspapers and kind of started building a kind of a some kind of a portfolio and did some work for the national newspaper based in Abu Dhabi, um, which obviously was, was terrific. Having being based in Damascus, I did some feature stories for them, which took me out to the countryside. Um, and one thing, obviously, I guess one thing that struck me, and I, I talk about this in, in the book quite a lot, is this huge divide between the urban and, and rural uh, Syria. Um, it's, I guess we can start with the, the urban Syria. Um, from 2008 or thereabouts, from 2009, you had this liberalization of the economy actually play out on the streets of the major cities of Damascus and Aleppo, uh, Homs, Latakia, and, uh, and some other cities. So what you had were a huge growth in the number of um, private banks, in marketing companies, in kind of media in the sense that um, I guess general interest magazines and you know cars and stuff like this and it was an adver advertising industry was starting up uh, you know people getting jobs in a private sector this very very small private sector was starting to actually uh, expand a little bit um, and you had a whole host of new kind of cafes restaurants and, and that and people you know people in the private sector earned way over and above kind of what people in the private sector and the ministries, the people who worked, who were my colleagues at the, the state newspaper. So they had this disposable income and they could go to these cafes uh, in the major cities. So you had this kind of quite a, a, a kind of uh, productive kind of urban economy whereby this private sector was growing, people had disposable income. For the higher up management, I guess, in the private sector, you know, they could holiday in, in Turkey or in Lebanon a couple of weeks a year, and life was good for these people. Now, at the same time in the countryside, particularly in the east, in the desert, over towards Iraq, uh, from 2008 until 2010, 2011, there was a major drought, which destroyed the livelihoods of about in around a million people. So these farmers and laborers were forced off the land. They had nothing to, to work with, and moved to the urban areas of Damascus and Aleppo and Dara in the south and Homs. And obviously they moved because they were quite poor, they moved to the, the kind of the, the areas where rent was lowest and, and, and that. And they worked driving taxis and um, kind of any job they could get. Let's say in, in Dara they would, they would get work crossing the border and you know smoking cigarettes and you know driving taxis for, for tourists who were, which was growing, you know, lots of, especially particularly Western tourists wanted to come to Damascus and see you know, what was happening in the change and these historical, uh, fantastic historical sites, you know, Damascus Old City being one. Um, and it's no coincidence, and it's something that we, we hear very little about, I, I, I think, is this urban-rural divide that plays out in the revolution today. Um, Dara obviously was the, the start, the spark for the revolt in, in, in March 2011. And it's, it's no coincidence that the neighborhoods that saw demonstrations from the beginning were the same neighborhoods that these kind of um, urban people, farmers and laborers, had moved to looking for work. So they were, they were very, much, very much angry with the regime. Um, they had seen very little change that was taking place in Damascus. And I want to you know, paint this picture that you had a Cinnabon uh, a number of cinnamon cafes you had, kind of steakhouses in, in Damascus, and you know you had this real kind of opening up, and this people, people, the urban-based people really liked this change, and you know for them life was pretty good, and they liked what was happening, that they had this extra money, that they could travel, and that they could you know go to restaurants, whatever, four or five nights a week, uh, and essentially enjoy life. Um, today, for the most part, what we have seen is these poor suburbs that have revolted and that had protests in the beginning and are now either, I guess, um, have been shelled or have been uh, have experienced airstrikes by the regime. Uh, and they, they are essentially the same areas. The areas in, in the cities, in Aleppo and Damascus, let's take, let's take kind of Aleppo. Aleppo today is divided between East and West. So Western Aleppo is, for the most part, a, the Christian community is there. The people who went to these Cinnabon restaurants and went to the steakhouses live in this area. In the east side of the city, 
were the people who came from the desert, the, the farmers and, and that, um, who are, you know, who, who, who live there. And you have this divide, you have this kind of a no, no man's land in between, and today you have rebels on one side being shelled, uh, experiencing airstrikes. For the most part, the areas of eastern Aleppo are, um, are have been, uh, you know, most of the civilians have left. Um, and I think this is a really important point to make because this is why the revolt in Syria hasn't played out as it played out. It's a major reason why the revolt in Syria hasn't played out as it has in uh, Egypt or Yemen or, or Libya, um, Tunisia even as well. Th there is no, or there is very little support for the revolt by the kind of wealthy urban classes. Um, they, they don't want change. Um, you know, they, they were happy with what they have. For them, freedom, freedom was an idea. Democracy was something that was Western kind of established. Uh, didn't quite know what it was because it was never discussed. And you couldn't discuss such things in, uh, in, in Syria at the time. Uh, one thing that did happen early on in the revolution was that um, there was this kind of opening of discussion between people in, in, the, in Damascus, and particularly at least I can speak of, where people would say, well, you know, what's happening? Should, the, should there be elections? Should the regime enact widespread reforms? Um, and others said, some people said no, and some people said yes, and some people obviously supported the the revolt and said, you know, look, look the regime is, is, has been shooting people in Deran and Homs, and it's obvious what they're doing. We know what's happening. And others said, well, listen, this is now a foreign based plot. Um, and in the early, you had this, and it was fantastic to see this kind of opening of discussion by Syrians. People talk, talked about issues that they wouldn't dream of talking about before March 2011. Um, but quite quickly, after a few months, these kind of two sided solidified. So if you had, for example, two friends, one was pro-government, and one said, you know, we need new governments, uh, and we need change, and we need uh, reforms and that, these two people wouldn't talk to each other anymore. So that dialogue was cut, uh, remains cut. And, you know, we had, you had people who kind of would defriend their friends on Facebook. They wouldn't talk to them anymore, and, you know, because they didn't agree with their, their political ideas. Um, so this... This urban-rural divide, and it, it's still true today, in the city center of Damascus, there has been little or no violence, aside from car bombs. We, we don't know who's taking part in, the, in those. Um, these people don't want, for the most part, they don't want change. They've seen that, what, they've seen what, what has happened in Homs and in Aleppo, and they don't want that. They don't want that kind of violence in their own streets. Uh, and lots of these kind of urban people as well, if we can kind of take out a section of, of that population. They, quite a few people, particularly businessmen I spoke to, they, they recognize that the regime is a mafia. They don't like the regime, but they're not willing to go on the streets and protest. Um, and they're not willing to fund the opposition, the, the, be it the rebels or the political opposition based overseas. Um, and they're waiting. I mean, I had so many conversations with people who would say, you know, the regime's going to end soon, inshallah, and all this, this kind of thing, you know, but they played no hand or part in the revolt itself. Whereas the people in the, the poorer kind of areas of the country, in the poorer suburbs of the major cities, were living and dying for this revolution. They were the people who were protesting every day, who were getting detained, who were seeing their families and friends killed in front of their eyes. So you have this enormous kind of societal division. And that's, I think at least, it's something that's not going to go away for quite a long time. Uh, the, re the regime is going to fall. It's, you know, it, it, I think it has ensured its own downfall by being so violent. And um, you know, obviously the question is when, we don't know. Um, but you know, a lot of people wonder why uh, it has persisted for so long. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think, one kind of analogy I was kind of working with was that, you know, when you have a house of cards, and obviously the, the state system in Syria was constructed in a very durable way by uh, Bashar's father, Hafez al-Assad. He, was, he was, must have been quite a smart guy in that he placed um, Alawi people at the kind of the higher echelons of, of the government, certainly of the security forces, uh, also with the, the military kind of officer corps as well. And you had this system in place whereby defections and dissent and kind of genuine fear 
of an Islamist kind of uprising was very much kind of present in, in people's mind. Um, I mean, if, if you go, for example, to a ministry and you needed to speak to or get approval from a kind of mid-level or high-level kind of high-ranking um, uh, civil servant, you would inevitably, the accent you would hear speaking to you would be a coastal accent, which is where most Alawi um, people came from. So the people, such as these people, these mid-level or even higher kind of level civil servants, they would have, you know, there was no chance that they would ever turn away, turn against the regime, whether that's symbolic or, or not, whether their actual def the defection would be important or not. It's very difficult to say. And that plays through, uh, true also for the, uh, the intelligence services and the military as well. But to get back to my kind of analogy, I mean, you had this house of, of cards or this kind of, you know, whatever kind of a construct that collapsed as the, as the, um, the revolution began and, and, and grew. But it didn't collapse outwards. It collapsed kind of inwards, if we can say. And instead of you know, falling to pieces, you had this much smaller kind of, but much more nimble um, system, or this kind of a much more kind of solidified uh, government and regime. Um, so you know, that's why we're seeing today. And I think that's why it's persisted for so long. Um, I guess, I mean, another point to make is that when I left in February of this year, and obviously began listening and reading a lot more English language and, and Western media, I was kind of bowled over by the fact that we were hearing very little from people who either did not support the revolution or were kind of in between. People who kind of, you know, they didn't like the, the, the government and they knew what the government doing, was doing was bad, but at the same time didn't, you know, um, support the violent uprising. Um, because certainly my experience of being there was that you had, you know, there, there were a lot of people who didn't like the regime and didn't support the violence uh, associated with, with the revolution. Um, I suppose to speak a little bit about how da what daily life was like for the first 12 months, it's, it's a fascinating thing to see a society and a system that had been so tightly controlled and so kind of run in such a rigid way um, slowly kind of fall apart and break up. Um, I mean, you know, before the revolution started, people lived in fear of policemen, of being stopped by the police and having to pay bribes or whatever the case may be. Um, after the revolution began, people would, you know, they would, they would fail to stop it, for example, they would fail to stop at police at, at traffic lights. And I saw a number of occasions whereby you had the, you know, your traffic policeman sitting on his, mo on his motorbike at a, an intersection. Um, and cars would just drive straight through, you know, on a red light. And, you know, this is the people didn't, you know, there's a sense that, that the, the state was collapsing. And there was this kind of, you know, people didn't essentially didn't take responsibility for, the, for their own actions. Um, so, y you know, it's obviously it's difficult for the Western media to get these nuances into kind of a, you know, a two minute or a five minute news package when, for the most part, they want to know about rebel activities and how, you know, the space has fallen or this, you know, this, this fighting between rebels and, and, and government forces, which is, this, which is the vast majority of what we're getting is, is this kind of bang bang kind of journalism out of Syria. I think it's important because if there is any more kind of direct Western military intervention, you have this whole section of society that, have not, that don't like the government, but don't support the, the revolution, uh, will become radicalized, I think at least, if and when you had a more kind of direct military um, intervention. And this is, this is something also that is discussed uh, very little indeed, and it's very important. Uh, and the reason for this is because you have the specter of what happened in Iraq. And of course, the government in Syria has played this up for years and years, saying that you know, we've got Lebanon to our west, and we've got Iraq to our east, and we have, we're this, this rock of stability. You know, um, We need to keep things as they are politically. We've opened the economy. You have these restaurants and, and bars and nightclubs opening up. You've got access to money because there's private banks and you can get married, you can get a loan, which, which is a major issue, being a, such a young uh, society. Um, and this, the specter of what happened in Iraq really kind of w was, was hanging over people's head. Um, and if, or you know, it, it seems unlikely, we don't know, 
there was a more direct foreign military intervention, be it in, in the, it be it kind of airstrikes or uh, the kind of, kind of, I guess, direct arming of rebel groups with whatever it be, guns or anti-tank missiles or, you know, kind of uh, shoulder rockets and that. Um, you will see, I think at least, a kind of a, a very, very serious reaction against this. And you will see the radicalization of a large section of Syrian society that are not involved in the revolution as it stands, pro or against right now, but will, um, you know, because of, because of what's happened in Iraq and because Lebanon has been and had been so unstable, and they will kind of possibly take up arms against any kind of Western um, intervention. Or what a lot of people might do is move to the regime side whatever shape that takes in the future. We don't know when the regime will fall. It's, I think it's certain, as I say, that it will happen. Um, again, you know, the question it seems to be is that how many people are going to die before it actually happens? And it, you know, it's something that's discussed, I guess, is that you know, if there was a more direct foreign intervention, you would probably see the regime fall pretty swiftly. So if you had airstrikes across the country, um, I, I think at least that the regime would fall, you know, pretty much overnight if, you, if their military installations are bombed and presidential palaces and, and so on are, are bombs, the regime will fall. But in the time that passes after that, where there is no kind of structure, when this political opposition based outside the country is so disorganized, um, you, you would have a huge, I, I, would, I think at least you would have a, a massive kind of period of time whereby there would be a lot of Deaths. So I think whether there's direct, kind of more direct foreign intervention or not, there's going to, a lot more Syrians are, are going to die. And the other option, obviously, I guess, is to kind of let it be from a, you know, a Western perspective or from Washington's perspective, so that leave things as they are. And um, let, the, you know, let it play out and kind of hold back and say, well, listen, we've no hand or part in this. Um, and if that happens, and it will, it's more, I guess it's more, more likely to happen. Um, rebels will slowly take, you know, more and more areas. And I think sometime in the near future, Aleppo is likely to fall. I think today there were three helicopters and a, and a MiG aircraft were, were down by Syrian rebels. And also today was, I think for the first time, found that uh, rebels are able to use this kind of quite a sophisticated kind of uh, man pad, uh, shoulder rocket launcher, which, which can take down um, helicopters and and uh, military aircraft and that. To get back, I guess, to my own perspective, um, it was, and, and obviously the book is an eyewitness account, it was in one sense easy, in one sense difficult trying to report what was happening. Um, obviously before the revolution, it was kind of, I was writing a lot more kind of feature articles and some tourist pieces and, and, and travel articles and that. Uh, when the revolution started, there was this huge interest in you know, doing news and what can you report and can you get out to protests and can you get to Dera, can you get to Homs? Um, and I didn't do any of those things during the revolution because I felt that if I had to do that, having been a registered uh, accredited journalist with the Ministry of Information, um, you know, the number of checkpoints between Damascus and Dera or Damascus and, and, and uh, Homs, I would have swiftly have been turned back or deported um, or worse perhaps and uh, I felt that to kind of keep to the routine I was I was keeping and kind of see how things played out in front of me was a much more kind of you, you know I wasn't getting to see intentionally to see protests in that or the consequences of shelling but at the same time I felt that it's better to be there than to be sitting you know back in Europe or or over here um, so it was really quite tricky to organize kind of meetings with activists and that. Um, you know, some, in some cases it took months to speak to people. In some cases I planned for months to speak to kind of rebels and, and people who actually were smuggling arms from, uh, from Lebanon over to Syria. And things at the last minute fell apart. Um, and it was just the way it was. I think I had to be extremely careful in how I, how I operated. I mean, as I talk about it in the book, it was kind of a case that, you know, every week I would change my email address and kind of change 
uh, passwords kind of every day almost. And I remember one stage sitting in my house and kind of going through, you know, trying to remember what email matched with what password and sitting for like almost an hour trying to match these things up and just being just so tired and trying to, you know, to see, you know, do they need, does the Washington Post need copy or wh whoever was the case. It was just kind of absolutely exhausting. But I certainly felt it was, it was the way to go. Um, and a number of other journalists, uh, a guy I lived with, a Dutch guy I know, um, innocently enough went to a demonstration um, outside Damascus and was picked up and put on a plane and deported it. That was in July of 2011. So he, he just got a couple of months. And when I heard about this, I felt that, you know, for me to do that, it's, it's not worth it. Because to see, um, you know, to contact activists, you don't know who they are, first of all. You, you can't trust them. Maybe it's a, a regime ploy. Um, if and when you go and you meet them, you're a foreign journalist, you're putting them at danger. Um, but that's not to say at the same time that I, you know, I did see protests and, and uh, some pretty horrific things. Um, in the summer of 2011, I was going to meet a friend in central Damascus and happened to come by a protest outside the university. Um, and I was, you know, I was kind of walking along the street and kind of in my own world thinking about something. And next thing, this small group of students bunched together. It was exactly 3 o'clock on uh, Thursday. This group of students got together and started shouting, Hariye, Hariye, freedom. Um, and out of nowhere, these police and security guards essentially moved on these 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 kids, and they were that's what they were. They were they weren't uh, didn't have guns and they weren't violent or anything like that. And uh, so I was walking on the street, and I was going actually right past. My intention was to go right past where this protest was, uh, where it happened and ended. You know, in essentially a few seconds. And I was kind of like, okay, what am I going to do here? And if I get you know, they were chasing the, the protesters and down different streets and alleyways and into shops and that. So I kind of said, you know, I felt that you know, if I get caught here, it's, it's not going to tell them that it was a complete coincidence being a foreign journalist at a protest. You know, it's going to be a very difficult thing to, to try and convince them. Um, so I kind of backed into a shop and kind of, you know, everyone it was, was dumbstruck by what happened. I mean, the shopkeeper was kind of his head was down and he was, you know, he wasn't looking outside. He was afraid to see what was outside because this was his shop. And obviously the security would come to him uh, and ask, you know, did you know anything about this? And he felt that he, he could be at risk. Um, you know, and he kind of went about his, his own work. And it was really interesting to see how people reacted in, in that moment. Um, so I went into the shop and tried to buy something. I didn't have any change. And I walked back out and kind of continued on my, my own route. And, um, you know, this one, one student who was this kind of you know, this young, young guy, he wasn't, there was nothing violent about him, um, was being taken right across in front of me in, in handcuffs and the security officer was saying to him, you want freedom? I'll show you what freedom, what freedom really is. And, um, you know, I don't know what happened to that guy. Uh, and I continued on, on further on the streets and there were kind of, you know, there were protesters were scattered down the different streets and, and one guy had been pretty um, badly kind of hurt on his face and his arm. Either he was hit or when he ran away, I, I'm not sure. Um, and I was like, this is a fantastic opportunity. You know, I've been very careful so far in terms of you know, putting myself or putting Syrians in, in danger. Um, I'm going to try and talk to this guy and find out how they organize to meet and, you know, what their kind of goals are and, you know, what kind of contact they have with maybe uh, opposition members overseas. But, you know, as we turned this corner, I saw someone I knew who was, who worked for a, a ministry and he was on the phone. And I, you know, I kind of felt at that stage, you know, this guy knows me. And if I'm seen, spoken to this young guy who's got blood down his face and, and on his arm, this could really be quite tricky. And my point is, is that in every neighborhood, in every city and town that is currently under the control of the regime, you have not spies, but you have people who will talk to uh, the, the security forces. And I'm not sure if you guys know the case of Austin Tice, the Texan journalist who went missing. From what I understand, he began his reporting in the north of Syria and moved all the way south. And I remember reading his reports of the Washington Post and McClatchy newspapers and being you know, absolutely fascinating reporting. But I couldn't, I, I found it really difficult to, to understand how he was able to do these things and go on radio and go and do TV interviews 
and tweet and use his byline. I mean, for the most part, I didn't use my byline in, in what I was writing because, you know, you can't do that. You get caught. And it seems that when he, apparently he was close to a town where I lived um, in, outside Damascus. I, I moved out of Damascus kind of six months before the revolt started. Um, and he went missing in this area. But it seems to me at least that he continued to operate as he had been operating in the rebel-held areas. Now, when you're with the rebels or when you're rebel-held areas, you can move around with your camera, you can interview people, you can, you know, work kind of pretty independently It's as a, as a journalist operates. But when you're in an area controlled by the regime, you cannot walk down the street with a DLS or a camera, ask people, you know, what do you think is happening? Is there, a, have there been any kind of fighting in this area? Are there plans of demonstrations? You, you won't last five minutes before you're picked up, before someone sees you, before a shopkeeper phones the Mukhtar, the kind of the local kind of, uh, I guess, administrative policeman, and someone will come and, and get you. Um, and in, in a sense, I kind of you know experienced this at one stage. I, I had an official, an accredited 12-month journalist visa for two years, um, but at the same time, you know, I would get random phone calls from people I didn't know who they were. These guys saying, "Are you at home?" Um, what are you doing? Uh, I want to meet you. I'm, I'm going to come by your house. And I, I mean, I write about this again in the book. And I'm like, who, you know, who are you? I have no idea who you are. I have no idea why you're calling me. But I would kind of say, yeah, yeah, no problem. Come over. It's no, it's no problem. You know, I kind of try at least to give the impression that I had nothing to hide. But inside, it was kind of like, you know, is this guy coming to um, to arrest me, or you know, is he coming to beat me up, or or what? What's what's happening? And I had no idea, obviously. So, um, yeah, I mean, this guy one, at one stage called me and said, yeah, I'm going to be at your house in 15 minutes. Where do you live exactly? He knew the, t he knew the town where I was living. And um, I said these things that, you know, yeah, no problem, come over. When you get to this bakery, um, phone me and I'll meet you there. So he came in and he came upstairs. And, I, you know, in a sense, I kind of played the idiot in that. I didn't, I, I mean, I speak Arabic reasonably well, but I was kind of saying, you know, it was kind of, not quite understanding what he was saying in order to kind of, you know, and, and another sense was that the, the questions he, he was asking were so, so strange. I mean, he was asking what my, my mother's job was and what my father's job was and what, my, what were the names and, you know, and after a while I figured out that the point of that whole episode was to let me know that they could be in my house, they could call me and be in my house you know, within, within 15 minutes. Um, and when, when he called, I, you know, I kind of thought there was going to be a police car or a military vehicle or a, a jeep of some sort. And I went downstairs to meet him and he was kind of, he was sitting in this um, kind of a pickup van. And I was like, you know, this guy was, I was speaking on the phone to someone and I could see him across the street. I was like, this, this can't be him. But, you know, the idea, what, what at least the, the message it left with me was that you have no idea who these guys are. I mean, if you see a guy driving down the street in a pickup filled with fruit or potatoes or whatever it is, he could easily be a security guard uh, or an intelligence uh, official as easily as a farmer. Um, and this is another reason, I guess, not to take, as I felt at least, unnecessary risks. Um, Shortly before I left in, in February of this year, and this is the main reason I, I left, I was getting towards the end of, of my book, but I needed, I felt at least more kind of meaty material. Um, the foreign editor of the London Times was in town and I had done some work for them. And he said, yeah, we want to meet up and, and, and do some work together. And all this kind of through last winter, you had a lot of, a lot of journalists were allowed um, Tour, uh, journalist visas uh, granted by the government to come to Damascus uh, for a week or for 10 days or for five days. So they would come essentially, fly in, be greeted at the airport with their minder, taken to the Ministry of Information and bust around and uh, taken to Dera and to, to meet with the governor of Dera who would say, you know, these are outsiders, they're not Syrians and they want to destroy our country and they're Islamists, they're Al Qaeda and all this carry on. And then they would take the, the, the foreign journalists to a police uh, or a, a military um, complex and they would show them, you know, look at all our dead soldiers and this is what they're trying to destroy a country, etc. Um, 
on one occasion, this guy, this foreign editor for the Times of London, um, came, but wasn't assigned a minder, him and his photographer. So they had a good bit of leeway. And why they didn't, I don't know. So on one hand, you had all these kind of journalists who were coming for a week and getting, I felt at least, really good material. They were being allowed, you know, go to Homs or go to Dera, whereas I wasn't. I I'd pho would phone up the Ministry for Information and say, no, how can we bring these guys in? You don't know who they are. They don't know what they're talking about. I've been here for years and years, but you won't let me go. And they, they would, the ministry people would say to me, no, you're on a different, you're on a 12-month visa, you can't go to these places. So I, I guess they, they saw me as a kind of, you know, a slightly different, maybe security risk. So the foreign ed editor of um, the London Times said to me, yeah, we're going to Eastern Damascus. There was a huge protest there last um, Thursday, four days previously. And we're going there to find a, an underground hospital. So he, and he, and he said, you know, do you want to come? I, I couldn't turn it down. Um, also, you know, it was, it was this material that I needed, I felt I needed for my book. And also, it was something that I wanted to see firsthand. And I, I felt that, you know, once I had that, I could, you know, it was, I, I could actually leave in good conscience that I had enough material for a book and kind of had kind of seen kind of both sides and was able to report on both sides of, of what was happening in Syria at the time. Um, so we got, a, we, got in this, we got in a taxi and, and went through a number of checkpoints to this area called Sakba. I write about it, write about it in detail in, in my book. Um, and for some reason we were allowed through five or six sets of, of checkpoints. Um, and our taxi driver was, he was telling the, the soldiers at the checkpoints that we were journalists and kind of, they looked in and they kind of checked the glove compartment, they checked the, the trunk of the car. And, you know, we all kind of looked like, I guess, foreign journalists in the sense, and the, the foreign editor or the other people who were with me were kind of mispronouncing kind of Arabic, so they at least gave the sense that they were actually who they were saying they were. Um, and the foreign editor had been there five days, four or five days previously, and there was this huge demonstration Apparently, 5,000 people protected by the the rebels, um, but the scene we that that greeted us when we got there was a very very different scene indeed. In the intervening period, the regime had regained control of the area and had laid waste to this residential neighbourhood, um, and you know we we saw some pretty kind of horrific scenes. So we got to the square and you could see. I mean, on one side, I mean the inside of houses in terms of kind of chandeliers, sofas, beds, you know, things that you, you, you know you shouldn't see when you're outside, you know, really kind of striking kind of uh, images in that. Um, you know, other buildings, a mosque had been destroyed, um, and the locals were kind of hiding in kind of corners of the square and kind of, you know, they were kind of looking at us and who are you and, and, and that, and they weren't sure if they should come and talk to us, but at the same time they wanted to get their message out, they figured that we were foreign journalists. And, um, you know, for me, I wasn't quite sure what to do um, in, in terms of, all right, okay, where am I going to, as a freelancer, where am I going to pitch the story and what's the story going to be about and how am I going to structure it? And the, um, I was doing some uh, translation or some in, interpreting work for the, the Times guy and uh, I was kind of being dragged in different, different places. And we walked around this area for a while and um, one guy was kind of walking past with some... Um, vegetables and he said I want to show you something come with me come over this way kind of like this um, so we followed him down this kind of maze of uh, kind of between houses and apartments and and that and came to a school and where they pulled up a um, a large carpet and they had there were a number of disfigured bodies there and I asked we, we asked obviously you know why are they here and, and what's going on and who are they and they they said that they were local civilians um, guys who had, you know, their eyes had been gouged out and their noses had been cut off and their lips had been, had been cut off as well. Um, they said they were local civilians who were taking part in demonstrations and that they were hiding them there because they, if they tried to in any way kind of publicly bury them, the regime would come, the regime had now retaken control of the area, that, you know, the security would come, take the bodies and present them as dead soldiers or as, as whatever it was, or as terrorists even, or whatever they figured. And that was a particularly kind of striking kind of day. Uh, that was a day I kind of decided to leave in the sense that I felt, you know, the, the following day, 
the, the guys who were with me, the reporters who were with me, went back to London, but I was kind of still there in the area, kind of living, you know, 15, a 15 minute drive from this area, and passing through checkpoints, and I didn't know, you know, what aspect of the intelligence service, maybe they had followed me that day, maybe they hadn't, you know, and, and this sense of paranoia kind of grew, and, you know, you get to a stage when you're, when you're, you're you know, you're trying to get into your, your email accounts, and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're putting nothing in the body of the email and you're putting your kind of, your, what you want to say to an editor in a Word document that's attached and you don't know if that's working, you don't know if you're, you know, if they can read these things through their servers. Um, if you're sitting kind of watching TV and, you know, you hear steps coming up the, the, the uh, stairs outside and you're kind of right, is this someone coming for me? This is this the time. And um, I mean, it got to a stage as well that when I went to turn on my car, it was kind of like, you know, holding your breath, and when I figured, when I got to that stage, I was kind of trying to figure that this is, you know, it's not much, not much fun to, to, to be living in that kind of, that kind of climate. Um, but to finish, I guess, I, I think I want to stress the idea that S Syrian society is extremely divided, and that any post um, conflict situation will be very tenuous. Um, and any political system in Syria, really, it, it's going to be really quite difficult to figure out how that comes about because there are, it, it is just so radicalized. And I, I mean, I haven't even spoken about the Shabiha gangs, these pro-government, mainly Alawite, um, who are, you know, the real terrorists, I guess. Um, you know, what happens to them? They're, they're, they're possibly tens of thousands strong, uh, armed to the, to the teeth. They've carried out atrocities across the country, I guess from Daraya to Al Hule last summer. You know, when, when the regime falls, what happens to them? Will they go back to the mountains? Um, will they continue to fight? Will they kind of operate as a counter kind of insurgency against whatever uh, government takes the place of Bashar al-Assad? We, we don't know, but these are all Things that we hear very little about, but I think, you know, when the regime falls, um, there are things we'll be hearing more and more about. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, it's time for discussion, questions and answers. So, who wants to, uh, <coughs> who wants to pose a question? Yep. Hi. Um, I wondered if you had any thoughts on, on um, if and when the regime falls, where, where Assad yeah. It's a good, good question. Um, I believe they've been offered asylum in, in Dubai and Russia. We've heard <laughs> rumors about these things. We don't know. And they've, you know, apparently the, the family has been offered money and millions of dollars to go to Dubai and to be held up there. Um, the alternative is that there, well, there are a couple of alternatives. One alternative, I guess, is that they um, flee back to the coastal mountains to their kind of homeland area and set up kind, some kind of a defense kind of checkpoint situation there whereby no one can come in or come out. Um, or they fight to the, last, to the last man. And I think we have to remember we're dealing with a mafia. It's essentially a mafia organization here. Uh, the the uh, Assad's Bashar, more so his, his brother. I don't think they're, you know, they're not, they're not leaders, even Gulf leaders, um, Leaders of Gulf countries have been educated in, in Western universities. They've studied diplomacy and, and that. These guys have, don't have any of that. They don't have any negotiating skills. They don't really understand what it is to kind of give and take. Um, and that kind of leads me to believe that it's going to be kind of a, a last man, perhaps stand in the, in the presidential palace um, at some stage. Yeah, it's hard to say though. So, I mean, assume for a minute that Bashar al-Assad did not make it out of this. Why? You know, he, he gets killed, and then what happens? I mean, you sort of alluded to some of this, but I'm just curious to draw you out a little bit more. I mean, if, if the Alawites were the backbone of the sort of bureaucracies mm -hmm. and the business elite and the military elite and the security service yeah. elite, I mean, do, do the now majority Sunnis sort of take revenge? Do they sort of, is there some sort of process of integration? I mean, yeah. I don't sort of. It's see a kumbaya moment after this. Yeah. But, but if, if you speak to activists, they'd say that 
you know, Syria is for all Syrians and we've no problems with Alawis or Christians or Druzis or Shia, you know, this is our country. And a point made to me uh, continuously speaking to activists was that, listen, Syria operated as a country and we had democracy back in the 40s and 50s before the Assads came. And we, you know, it, it was fine. We, we all got on, Christians and Muslims and Druzi, everyone got on together okay before the, the regime came and that it's the regime that's using this sectarian kind of message. Um, but it, it is really difficult to say. I mean, you know, I mean, if and when, if the, the, the president and his, uh, his, his family or his, his brother, you know, the, the military and security leaders are, are killed, what happens then? Will, the, will, will it be a case that, you know, the Shabiha kind of retreat to the mountains? We, we don't know. But I think the longer the regime stays, the more difficult it would be to piece the country back together and the more difficult it would be to kind of I don't know, reintroduce a sense of trust between different religions and, and as well it's not just a sectarian issue as I kind of the point you know the point, main point I want to make was this urban rural thing as well and that's you know it's I think that more the more people die the more difficult it's going to be um, and that's you know, that's, that's how it is, I guess. Can I just pick up on, a, on part of your response there, which is, so you said on the one hand, um, you said in your remarks that if, if there were a, an internationally led bombing campaign and the arming of rebels, the regime would Similar fall. Similar to Libya. Yeah, yeah. Would, would fall quickly. And, um, and then, then you just said that uh, the longer the regime hangs on, the worse the mess will be afterward. Yeah. So, there is no good. Okay, so right. So what do you do? So what do you do now? Right. So does that mean that in order to maintain Syria's territorial integrity, there's an argument to be made to lead, trigger the fall of the regime now? Is that where this? It's. I'm not okay. even sure where I yeah. stand on that. There is no good option. If there is a Libya-style intervention, the aftermath will see tens of thousands of more people die. If there is not, and if it continues as it is, mm. it's still going to continue as it is. You know, there, there is no good situation, um, or good, good outcome. I, I guess, I think at least that, you know, if, there, if, if the rev revolt and the opposition are tainted by this Western imperialist kind of feeling, or this, you know, if, it, if they kind of dilute the, the revolution, it will be much more difficult again to, to piece the country back together because, you know, those who Opposed the millions of Syrians who oppose the revolution would say, "Oh, you know, you're working for America, or you're working for um, uh, Saudi Arabia or Qatar or something." So, if if Western countries and if other countries as much as they can, if they stay out, or even if what they're doing and they do it very much under the table and very much low key in terms of arming rebels, um, at least it remains a Syrian. Mm. You know, they can say, "This is ours. We mm. did it ourselves. We didn't get help from anyone outside," and. In terms of a society going forward, it, you know, it, it, it will just, it, you won't have this kind of Western kind of imperialistic tainted issue like you had, for example, um, in Iraq. Okay, so we'll start over here. Um, so I wanted to ask what we know about the Syrian opposition because there seems to be very little information in Western reports. Uh, they seem to be not a single opposition but various groups, some possibly Al Qaeda type groups some homegrown. There's also something that it seems like an opposition that's sort of loyal opposition, this opposition that's negotiating with the government, mm -hmm. which doesn't seem that credible at the moment. Yeah. And so what do we really know about who is the opposition? Yeah, I mean, when you, when you, when you use, when we use the word opposition, hmm. we don't, who are we talking about? Are we talking about the Burhan uh, Ghalions, the kind of guys who are based in Cairo or Istanbul or uh, the Gulf or who Paris. go on, yeah or Paris exactly mm -hmm. who go on you know Al Jazeera every night and say we need to get the regime out uh, these political leaders the guys as part of the SNC the new coalition or are you talking about the rebels on the ground who are the engine of this revolution today or are you talking as you mentioned the kind of moderate uh, political opposition guys who are based in Damascus who are in dialogue and have been in dialogue with the regime for a very long time, who are essentially on a leash, the government lets them out kind of, you know, lets them publish in a critical article kind of once every couple of years and then pulls them all back in and arrests them and goes on this kind of 
plays out this thing, and you know, for, for decades that's been the case. Um, and it, it's it's troubling to to think who is it going to be that actually uh, rules the country when when the government falls. Um, is it going to be the established political leadership that's based overseas, the kind of the, the um, coalition people who have been trying to get more international kind of uh, uh, backing and, and finance, finan kind of financial backing as well, or is it going to be the rebels on the ground, the guys with the, you know, the Allah Akbar kind of things around the black kind of flags and that, um, and it's you know, at some stage, I mean, you know, the 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 overseas-based political opposition will feel like they're going, that they feel that it's their place to take um, kind of high positions in any future governments. But the rebels are going to say, well, hold on a second, we, you know, we, we fought and died for this uh, revolution, we gave our lives, our friends have, have died uh, for this, we're not going anywhere until we get some serious, uh, be it political or, or military uh, representation in, in a future government. And they're the guys who will have the guns. So you know that's a whole new kind of issue, and it's it's good to look at. I mean, it's never good to kind of compare countries, but I mean, in in, in Libya, it seems to have worked rather well. Um, but then again, Libya hasn't been through twenty months of extreme violence. If I could just follow up, just a little sure. follow up, because there is the accusation that some or many of the fighters are foreigners, and like Iraq saw this influx of fighters from Syria. Now mm -hmm. there seems to be the reverse for people coming in from. Yeah, well, in Iraq, I wouldn't say they, they went through Syria, but they weren't actually Syrians. But I would say, like, I'd say very a very small but growing percentage of rebels of fighters are foreign jihadis, um, and they're very important. They're important for the rebels, and, and they're quite good at what they do in terms of driving trucks into government buildings and or uh, you know s stuff like that. Okay, so I'm just going to continue this way across the room, so over here. Um, I'm just curious, it sounds like the fall of the regime is imminent, and I'm just curious what you think mm -hmm. will lead to their fall, and how you think that'll shape the post-Assad state. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to say, I mean, it's, you, you, no one knows when it's going to happen. I do think, as I say, I keep saying it, that it will happen. In, in what guise, it's really difficult to say. It seems that in the eastern part um, of the country, they have, uh, rebels have taken pretty much control of the east. And they've taken control of pretty much all of the north. Uh, obviously the, the Kurdish area is something, oh, it's a whole mess by itself. Um, and they've taken actually in the last couple of days a, a very large military base just um, west of Aleppo. So I mean, they have some control, I guess, in eastern Aleppo in the actual urban areas. And now they've got control of this base. So they're coming kind of from the, the western side and the eastern side, and their idea obviously is to cut the route between Damascus, Homs, and Aleppo, and kind of smother the, the, the government's military presence in, in Aleppo. Um, I think that's probably like one of the next things to happen. When that will happen, I don't know. And I, I imagine that from there they will move south to Hama and to Homs, and eventually um, to Damascus. So this could play out though for, you know, it, it could be over by the spring or the summer, it, it could go on for years. Anyone who tells you like it's going to be over in 12 months or six months, you know, they, I wouldn't go along with that. I just wanted to ask from your kind of personal interactions with Syrians whether or not um, you found that people were divided within families, families and friends who had fallen out over who was with and who was against the president, and you know yeah. how that will be dealt with. Those kind of family divisions are mm. absolutely. Yeah, well, I knew an, an, uh, an Alawi family. Um, the son worked for a, an embassy, and he was completely anti-government. And his father was anti-government as well. But his mother was 100% pro Bashar, pro regime. I mean, he, he told me about this one occasion when um, his father's friends came over. His father's friends used to come over before the revolution to kind of play cards and stuff. But when the revolution started, the mother stopped them from from coming over. She didn't want that kind of discussion. Um, anything bad said about the, the government. Um, it, it, you know, it, it happens. I think, I think for the most part, the Christian community is much more united in their opposition to the revolution as they see it, this kind of Islamist kind of campaign. Um, 
And I think urban Sunni families also are, are divided, mm. you know. I mean, they, they constantly bear this question of, you know, and what now and what happens after, you know, you want the regime to fall with what happens then and who's going to be the next president and the next prime minister and what plan do you have and, you know, there's, there's been quite a few kind of initiatives of the day after and the new judicial system and all this kind of thing. But I mean, you know, th those people, the, the Alawi middle range kind of government workers that I spoke about, you know, are they going to be able to keep their jobs or are they going to flee back to the mountains in fear? Will they be accepted by the Sunni majority? And we, we don't know. General Canales. Well, I, I was wondering, because seem, you seem to refer to the rebels, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more on the relation between the nonviolent uh, opposition to the regime and the free Syrian army. Yeah. And how that plays out. You know, and especially when it comes to casualties, or where are casualties? I mean, yeah. what can? They seem to have a very good handle on what the casualties are. I know there's a a group, which isn't a group at all, it's a single guy based out of um, a small English town that the English language media goes to for <laughs> <laughs> everything. And actually Reuters wrote an article about this guy um, saying that it was just one guy and not this organization, but continued to use his, his, his quotes and that. I, I don't want to say anything bad about the guy, but you know, you, you know when he's, it's his name, it's Syria, Com uh, what is it? Observatory, yeah, for human rights, uh, as if it's kind of this right. established kind of institute where, in fact, it's a guy above his shop in Coventry or something in England that he's got like 30 mobile phones laid out in front of him, and half of them are to LA Times or, or whatever, and the other half is to activists on the ground, and it's really tricky to kind of, you know, how much does this guy actually know? Um, in terms of relationship between the the peaceful protesters and and the arm the, the the armed the rebels. I think there's very little, but um, there's a really good journalist who's still based in Damascus, a guy called Phil Sands, who writes for the National. He's he's been doing some really fantastic reporting under really difficult circumstances. You should encourage you to read his articles. Um, I mean, he he interviewed a, a young guy who was 100% pro-peaceful revolution, and he didn't like the rebels, and he didn't want anything to do, he said, wanted to, you know, if we, things become violent, we're gonna destroy our country. And he was taking part in protests for a long time, and he was picked up by the security uh, forces, and was tortured and beaten, and released. When he was released, he found that all his friends um, had picked up guns, and were now part of the, the free army. And uh, I mean, he was telling this reporter, you know, well, what am I going to do? There's no protests in, in my neighborhood anymore because all the guys have picked up guns and they're now all in the countryside planning operations and, and, and uh, hits on uh, government checkpoints and that. So he's, you know, what do I do? I mean, I, there's no one to protest with, so I may as well, after being tortured, I may as well pick up a gun and, and join the, the armed uh, revolution, uh, rebellion. Um, you were talking about the difficulties you had doing research for your book, um, especially when you wanted to contact people to interview them. So how did you deal with the issue? How did you research people? How did you contact people when you, yeah. was it just accidental people? Yeah, a lot of the time it was, yeah. I mean, as I said, I mean, I would, some interviews took months in planning. Mm. I mean, it, you couldn't pick up a phone and say, hey, what do you think about the revolution? Let's sit down, let's have coffee, and let's, let's talk about it. It was more a case of a friend who know a friend, and I would meet, my, meet a friend, and you know, we would say, I know a guy from Dera, uh, or from uh, Hama, or from you know, Rastan, some kind of areas that have been uh, at the receiving end of, of shelling and airstrikes and that. Um, I'd say, yeah, it'd, it'd be great to meet him. And that's how it would go. So maybe a month later, the, my friend would speak to this guy and you know, maybe a couple months later, he would, would be actually able to sit down. But I wouldn't go through emails. I wouldn't go through phone calls or anything like that. You, you just couldn't. You know, either I'd be kicked out or, or something or worse, or the the Syrian guys would be in uh, in, in a lot of, um, of of danger. And as I said, some you know, some things were I just came across these things. You know, um, I was lucky in that. Um, 
I had friends in a town outside Damascus, and I went in and out quite regularly before the revolution started. So when the checkpoints went up, they knew who I was, and they knew my car. Um, they thought I was a German guy. I told them I was a, an English teacher and that. And uh, they'd ask these kind of strange questions, you know, which is nicer, Germany or, um, or Syria? And I'm, I'm Irish, I'm not German. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I'd say, oh, you know, Syria's great, and it's, it's, it's much better and stuff. I mean, even these, <laughs> even these guys at the checkpoints were, you know, these, they weren't, it's, it's, it's difficult to say, they weren't like the, the cre creme de la creme of security operatives. These were kind of regular guys, you know, and I mean, Amy, I know you know, like, that lots of so Christian civilians would, would pass out whiskey and bread, and when they'd stop at the checkpoints, it'd give them kind of, you know, it'd give them kind of food, and fruit and stuff like that, and this, was, this, this is how it worked, and oh, you know, I know this guy. And when you go to the checkpoints as well, they'd ask, um, I write about this again in the book, at Christ on New Year's Eve, they rejigged, they put all the um, checkpoint security guys, they moved them around, and on, on New Year's Eve, we, we, we went to a party um, out there in, in this town, and I was like, this is trouble, because this guy doesn't know who I am. And uh, they were checking all the cars. It was a whole new game, you know. Before you'd kind of you'd stop and they'd look in, they'd wave and they'd know the car. And off you go. Um, even on Fridays, which was the, the day of protest, which was, I mean, it was dangerous. It was, you know, I got got some good material there. Um, but on New Year's Eve, it was it was very different. And um, and I played the fool and kind of said, I'm an English teacher and I don't speak Arabic, and you know, did essentially what everyone else was doing. They were kind of drivers were getting out the cars and they were checking everything. The, underneath the, kind of the cars and the trunks and all this stuff. And I just kind of, kind of acted as if this is, you know, whatever, regular kind of stuff and no problem and look here and, and whatever, yeah. Uh, so to come back to sort of this big question of what do we do, when you heard people express distrust of American motives and Western motives, how absolute is that? I mean, if it's you were to come out in support to recognize an official opposition or if the statement came from the Gulf states, or from Turkey, or from Europe, would that, any of that make a difference, or is this, it has to be local? It, it, it doesn't have to be local. I mean... And the recognition's happening now, right? I mean, the opposition... Yeah, now, right? for, I mean, what's, for what it's worth, yeah. we don't know. I mean, I, I, I interviewed, I met people who, you know, who said that we want foreign intervention now. We want American planes over Syria bombing government sites right now. And I've met activists who said, no, we don't want any foreign interference. This is a Syrian revolt. This is ours. And we don't want freedom. One girl said to me, actually, we don't want freedom if it's free. We don't want freedom if it's handed to, uh, handed to us. Um, so even among the, the activist community, you had these kind of disparate kind of perspectives. Um, you know, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it goes in a circle because Turkey has to live with Syria on its border. And this is why they're kind of slow to act more forcefully. Um, I, get, I, I can't speak for the, the, the administration here, but I mean, they don't, I guess they don't feel enough as a, at risk. I mean, if, if the government falls, it's good in, in terms of uh, Iran has got a, an ally knocked out. But then, you know, Israel could have all sorts of stability right on its border. And we're actually seeing this in the last few weeks that our shells are falling in the, the Golden Heights and that. Um, but from people themselves, you know, it's, it's really difficult to say kind of that it's this or it's that because, you know, even among the activist community, some say yes and some say no. I mean, if you meet a guy from, from Aleppo who, who buried his son a couple of days before, I mean, he, he's as radicalized as, as, as anyone can be and, you know, he will he'll do anything to bring the regime down. Um, he would work with anybody hmm. in, in order for that to happen. So what I'm going to propose is that we, um, we end the formal part of our proceedings, but we continue over refreshment, um, and, um, which I'm sure Stephen would like. And, uh, but so if you could please join me in thanking Stephen for giving us his amazingly interesting talk.